Uh, hello, uh, so I'm Matt Smith, I'm from the University of Oxford, and this is some work uh, in conjunction with Daniel Moser from ETH, uh, Martin Strelmeyer and Ivan Martinovic, also from Oxford, and Vincent Lenders from Armaswiss. So whilst this is probably going to be the most crypto lightweight talk of, uh, of the workshop, hopefully it's going to make you think a little bit when you get on your flights home. So um, <laughs> the system in question here is ACARS. Now, ACARS is the aircraft communications addressing and reporting system, and it's widely used both in uh, avionic, uh, sorry, in, in both commercial and non-commercial aviation. It's been around for quite a long time, since the late 1970s, and it's now used for very different purposes to what it was originally intended. But since then, it's kind of multi-medium and multi-purpose, and one of the key things here is it's now easy to collect with a $10 SDR. So to look a little bit more closely at this, um, this is kind of a, a representation of the system. It's now presented over satellite, uh, very high frequency and uh, high frequency subcarriers. And it's kind of like text messaging for aircraft. So we have this kind of service provider that handles uh, messages and it's operated in a kind of cellular fashion. And in terms of who uses it, well, it could be air traffic control to do their air traffic control duties over data link rather than voice or it could be uh, airline operations centers. So they do things like updating about passengers or gate information. And in terms of where we come in, well, we kind of stand at the side, we use our SDRs, and over about nine months, we collected a, a million messages. And uh, we did this just on uh, satellite and VHF, I should say. So you would think with this in mind that obviously this is probably carrying some sensitive information. So. Uh, you'd have some sort of security uh, in place. Well, actually, ACARS doesn't have security as standard. It does have post hoc standardized security, but no one really uses it. Uh, it costs extra on top. And so we have this kind of situation where, uh, whilst many users require privacy, nobody really wants to pay. Um, so we collected all these messages, and we noticed that a certain set of business aircraft were sending seemingly scrambled messages. And when you organize these by the first two characters, you realize very quickly that this is a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Um, so uh, it gets better. Um, nine static keys were used by all aircraft using the cipher. These were shared. Um, and so obviously we got our pen and paper out. We did some frequency analysis and some deduction. And we got about three quarters of the key substitutions. Uh, we didn't get 100% because uh, of standard phraseo phraseology limits the characters effectively that are used. And the, the key thing here is we uh, narrowed this down to one particular avionics suite called the Honeywell Primus uh, avionics suite. Some example aircraft that use this are on the right. Um, and when we look a little bit more detail at um, uh, who uses it, um, and the manufacturing year, it kind of goes back to 2002, that's the earliest example that we saw of it, but um, a particular type of aircraft manufactured uh, on average in 2014, we're also still using this, and even some of those were manufactured in 2016, so it's still in use today. Um, so this is all well and good, but why do we actually care? Well, uh, a big chunk of these aircraft uh, have something called a flight tracking block in place. And to give you an idea of what this means, say, for example, we look at a, this is a, an aircraft that was flying last night um, on flight radar. Um, and you can see there's quite a bit of information there about where it's going from, where it's going to, who it is. But for some aircraft, uh, all you can find is, is this. And actually, when you look on a flight tracker, uh, the flight tracker will deny it that it, this plane has ever actually flown. Um, so from this, we can kind of uh, infer that there's some sort of privacy sensitivity uh, going on, and this has been undermined by the weak cipher. So actually, 90% of the aircraft observed on VHF and 94% on uh, SATCOM uh, had one of these flight tracking blocks in place. And to give you an idea of what this means in practice, well, 30% of the messages were status reports, um, uh, and this reveals position, departure, and... Uh, arrival information. So for one aircraft, we could see it took off from Turkey, where it was at these two particular times, when it was landing in Farnborough. And according to fly radar, well, this aircraft never actually flew anywhere at all. Um, so just to close, we, uh, oh sorry, no, I should just add very quickly, blocked aircraft were responsible for 90% of all the sent status reports. So clearly some sort of privacy issue there. Just to close, uh, we did disclose this to Honeywell. They said it wasn't a problem. Uh, they said that the cipher isn't encryption but obfuscation, so it's not a security risk. I'll just leave you with the quote down the bottom there where uh, apparently uh, obfuscation becomes encryption when it's good enough. So um, <laughs> thank you. We do have a financial crypto paper, by the way, that explains it in full, but thank you.
Anyone flying back on a jet? <laughs> Private jet? Oh, hold on, uh, aviation expert's going to ask a question. Greg. Uh, actually, I'm putting on my civil liberties hat. A lot of those flights are rendition flights, and there are civil liberties organisations that would really like to know about Yes, yeah, so... so um, Potential. We do have we are, we do have some some more work that looks at the wider issue of ACARs and privacy. Um, this can be anywhere from business aircraft flying around to um, uh, intelligence aircraft. So there's a whole range of stuff in there. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again for a cool talk.